us today through our pastor and we are ready to receive it and put it into action, right? So thank you so much for being here with us today, Journey Family. God bless you and enjoy the service. Good morning, Journey Church family. Good morning to our online family. We welcome you today. Uh, we are excited today because we're gonna launch a brand new series. And, and I have to disclose because uh, my daughter uh, says I never tell or give her credit for anything. So I'm gonna give her credit right up in advance so she doesn't have to hear me say it again. Um, and that is, she inspired this sermon. Uh, and she, <laughs> I, that could be a good thing or a bad thing, right? <laughs> she inspired this message because a couple of weeks ago, she was over with a friend and uh, she said uh, to me at the dinner table, we were all sitting around the dinner table, and she said, Dad, hero or villain? And I said, what? And she goes, when, when you see yourself, are you a hero or are you a villain? And, and, and so I said, well, before I answer that, what are you? <laughs> and, and, she, and she says, uh, she, she says, I'm not a hero and I'm not a villain. And I was like, ooh, what is that? You know, she goes, I'm not a hero or a villain. And then uh, she says, and uh, mom is definitely a what? Well, come on, you can help me out. She's a hero, right? Mom is definitely a hero. That is, there is no question about that. She goes, so the question is, where are you? And I said to her, I said, well, I think I'm a kind of a hero. And she goes, no, no. She goes, what does that mean? I said, I'm some kind of hero. I just can't figure out which one it is. You know, and then, so we had this long debate about which are we, hero or villain. We went around through the whole family, and it came up, and I'll tell you in a moment, after I start this series, you'll find out which one I am. All right? So that is your tease for the rest of this message, is you're going to have to figure out which one I am. It's going to be obvious, because we spent the whole series, we're going to spend a whole series surrounding this theme. And, and the reason why I decided to launch on this, not only because she inspired me with that question, but also because we've been talking about, oh, since the beginning of the year, that God is giving us a word called advance, that we need to advance. And, and the question was, uh, and the scripture, I'm sorry, that we used was in Deuteronomy 2 and 3, where it says, you have circled around this mountain long enough, now m turn north. And so we want to continue with this ne these next steps of what we're going to talk about. Turn north. Now, uh, last week I told you that, that we, we defined our win. We also had to do something last week. And then I started to ask myself a question. How many of us fail to do, uh, fail to get started because of something that is our inner talk is preventing us from moving forward. It's not something that's real, a real obstacle, but it's the inner thoughts that seem, that seem to hamper us from moving forward. And as I was looking at that and decided to, to look at what my daughter was, was saying last week, I realized that she was really describing me as a anti-hero. Now, the thing is, anti-heroes, we've got we to gotta first get an understanding of what an anti-hero is. You see, it is more popular today than ever. In fact, I see it more in shows all too much and all too often is this anti-hero. See, the anti-hero is neither a hero or a villain. They're, 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 or they're somewhat of a hero, but they're also somewhat of a villain. <laughs> You know, you could say it either way you want to throw it up, but it says this, this, this anti-hero doesn't normally possess the character traits that, that we think of when we think of a hero. In fact, we look at the anti-hero, and yet you can find yourself rooting for this person throughout the entire show, but they never really are heroes 
they are somewhere in the journey of becoming, coming from villain to hero. They, they possess these characteristics. Let's define what an anti-hero is so that we are all on the same page of what I'm talking about. See, the anti-hero is a central character in a story who lacks conventional heroic qualities and attributes. They're, 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 they're someone that, that you would look at and you say, man, this is not like a Clark Kent. This person isn't a Clark Kent. This person isn't Superman or this person isn't Wonder Woman. They don't look like a Diana or act like Diana, like, act like they're a hero type person, but somewhere in between they find themselves. So you probably ask me, well, Peter, where have I seen these anti-heroes before? Well, let's take a look at them. Anti-heroes look like this. You can see uh, Hancock is an anti-hero. He's a drunk. He's a bum. He's, he's, he's not motivated to do heroic things. He may at times dip into the heroic, but he's not always motivated to do. You can see the Dark Knight. See, many of you grew up on Batman, but the Dark Knight really is an anti-hero. They're a billionaire that uh, type of person that has a sense of trying to correct or trying to implement justice. But they are really running from something. They are really traumatized by something in their past that has propelled them forward. Deadpool. You got Blade. You have Wolverine is an anti-hero. You got the Punisher, Iron Man. You go, Iron Man is not a hero. Iron Man is a drunk. Iron Man, see, if you read the comics, you realize that Iron Man was a drunk. Iron Man came from a place where he was a drunk, billionaire, playboy guy that didn't, didn't care about anything where he was selling his weapons or anything. He was and, and is an anti-hero. The Hulk has anger management issues. <laughs> He's bothered by everything. He's an anti-hero. Jessica Jones is an alcoholic and can care less about anything. She's running from abuse that has been plagued in her life. These are anti-heroes. You go, all right, Peter, I got it. Those are the superheroes that are anti-heroes. But what about in the real stories on everyday TV? What do they look like, Peter? Well, here they are. They look like... The Jeffersons. Mr. Jefferson is an anti-hero. He has to be propelled and convinced to do the right thing. But he goes about it all the wrong way sometimes. Are you starting to see yourself on the pages of anti-heroes? Because what the thing that we're drawn to with anti-heroes is they remind us of us. They remind us of, 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 of you and, and of me. They, there's something about the anti-hero that we all have in us. Someone that's not just perfect like Clark Kent, but someone who has some issues that they're dealing with. You got Mr. White from Breaking Bad and Jesse from Breaking Bread. They got good intentions, but somehow they keep falling and doing the wrong thing. They end up just being regular drug pushers, but you're sitting there saying, man, I'm rooting for him. I'm rooting for Jesse. Because every now and then, Jesse does the right thing. You got Dexter. This is my favorite man right here. Dexter is a serial killer, but Dexter, yeah, now, yeah, yeah, you got me right. Dexter is a serial killer. However, he just killed the bad guys. You know, we have the originals from all my teenagers out there. The originals are, are, are vampires. You sit there looking at Klaus, and you sit there looking at, at his brother, and you're saying, I just want them to do the right thing. Then you got House, Dr. House. And, 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 and for some of you who, who like Shonda Rhimes, you got uh, How to Get Away with Murder. What's her name? What's her name? Her name is Annalise, right? Annalise, she just makes all the wrong decisions in her life trying to get things right. There are people who are messed up. They're not okay. They're not perfect. They're broken. They have issues. And you recognize that when you're looking at these guys, I have issues too. And just maybe if there's hope for them, 
there's hope for you too. So over the next few weeks, you don't want to miss it. We're going to be talking about anti-heroes, people with issues. And I, and I said, well, what does God have to say about this? See, this, you can find a message on any page, listen to any conversation. You can find something. God will just speak to your heart. And I said, what is, what is God saying about this? And you know what I've realized? There is a lie that Im- is embedded in all that many of us have and many of us believe when it comes to God. There's this lie that we embrace, and it's a lie that we, we start to understand. And so over this series, I'm going to talk to you about a lie that you cling to, and I'm going to also give you the truth, the truth of what God is saying is. But many of us cling to this lie. You know what the lie is? The lie is that I that Jesus is waiting for me to be perfect, that God wants me to be perfect to be a part of his family, that God wants me to be his. And, and, and then when I look at the anti-heroes, I realize that they're not perfect. I realize that they, if I was to use the superhero terms, they're broken. They have a kryptonite or, or something that is, is, is debilitating them. But in, in, Jesus is not waiting for us to be spiritual superheroes flawless Clark Kent type of people. We're, he's not waiting us to have all, to be courageous and, and to have strong morals and, 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 and faithful to everything that we put our hands to do. He's not looking for that for us to be accepted by him. So many of us say, I'll just wait till I get there. I'll wait till a, por- a portion of my life or a season in my life where I'm so much better and then I'll start following Jesus. Because otherwise, I can't do what I want to do. I can't deal with all the issues. If I, if I ra- embrace and look at the issues that I have, I can never really walk in confidence. So Jesus is waiting on us to be perfect is the lie that we tend to believe. And so I want to remind us of a scripture that that when I look at Paul, Paul was an, a, a, a man that wasn't perfect. And Paul said, said this about himself. He said, uh, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. He's saying, God speaks to me. He says, but look, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. Paul says, let me tell you, I have a weakness too. Paul says, there's something that continues to be irritating and debilitating and humiliating. There's something that seems to knock me off. It could be a physical condition or it can be a mental affliction. It could be emotional. It could be financial. It could be professional. There could be something in my life. There's an arena of my life that I'm just being tormented and it's constant. I'm not perfect. I can't get over it. I can't get past it. He says, well, this is what I've done. This is what, how I try to take action. He goes, three different seasons, three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. He says, so I went to God. And, and I know God speak to me. You heard my previous verse, right? He says, I get revelations from him. He says, so God hasn't abandoned me. He says, but, but I went to him and I asked God several times in three different seasons of my life. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. He says, basically, Paul, you're stuck with this. Paul, you're not going to get a, this is not going to go away from you. There's certain things you have to learn to live through to have your breakthrough. And so here he says, here's the good news though, Paul. Here's the good news. My grace is sufficient. Even though you're, you're struggling with this debilitating and humiliating thing in your life, my grace is sufficient. My grace is strong enough to pull you through. My love and my forgiveness is everlasting to see you through. He says, Paul, I got your back. 
even when you're in weakness, even when you find this thing that you can't get over or this thing that is in your life that you're struggling with and you've been struggling with for five, some of you 15, some of you 50 years, you've been struggling with it. And he says, even though you're struggling with it, you don't have to be the hero. You don't have to be the hero, Paul. I'm the hero of your story. I'm the hero of your story. Paul, you don't have to be the hero, but know this. I work through anti-heroes. I I, I start working through those that are struggling and those that have issues. That's where my best work shows up, Paul. That's what he's saying. He says, I do great things when you're broken. You'll see my strength when you're dealing with issues. He says, I like dealing with the anti-heroes. Heroes. How many of you are glad to be an anti-hero today? <laughs> I, I know you, you say, well, I try to be the hero. Well, I try, but, 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 but we struggle. You don't have to be flawless. That's God's job. That was Jesus' job. He says, the more you try to do it, you discount what I've done for you. He says, that was my job. So the lie that we tend to believe is that, that Jesus is waiting on us to be perfect. But the truth is that, that in my weakness, my weakest moments, Jesus does some of his strongest work. That seems backwards for so many of us. It seems countercultural for us. But Jesus says, this is where I do my greatest work. When you struggle in your marriage and you're saying, I don't know how I'm going to stick in this. I don't know how I'm going to make it through. I don't know how we're going to see five years, nonetheless 25 years. I don't know how we're going to do it. Jesus says, just trust me. Come to me. I do my greatest work in your weakness. You may say, I I can't keep a job down. I lose, I keep losing my job. I I keep losing my financial stability and I'm addicted and I'm struggling with addiction and I can't get my head right and I don't know how to move forward. But Jesus says, I'll do some of my strongest work through anti-heroes. You're not hopeless. You're not worthless. There's something in you that I'm willing to do through you. So that people, when they see you, they'll say, she's been with Jesus. He's been with Jesus. Because it's only because we're leaning on him, we're trusting him, and we're saying, God, sustain us through this. That God is saying, I'm ready to do my greatest work. (laughs) I'm ready to preach this morning. Because we have some anti-heroes in the place. Jesus never said to us that we had to be perfect. He says, let me work with that thing in your life. Hand that failure, hand that weakness to me. He says, I will be your hero. Let me work through the broken and messed up. Are you broken? Are you messed up? Are you trying to act perfect and realize that that when you lay down at night that you still are struggling or imperfect? He said, don't let that stress you out. Let me do that work. You see, this is not the first time. We can go back to the Old Testament. We can look at some of our greatest anti-heroes. One of the greatest anti-heroes of of all times, and you've heard this story since you were young, is from a guy by the name of Moses. Moses is is one of those anti-heroes. Moses is well known as being an anti-hero. How? Because Moses was, was one when he was born, there was struggle and trial that was happening. And his, his mom had got the news that, that Pharaoh has made an edict to kill all baby boys. And, and, and he realized, Pharaoh realized that the population of the Hebrews were growing so much that they, they can overtake them and, and their society, the Egyptian society. So he says, no, I'm going to kill all the male boys. Because after a point in time, if the boys are clear, killed, they can't reproduce. There's no reproduction. You can't continue to grow. So we'll kill all these young boys. And the mom said, well, wait a minute, not my child. And she put her son in a basket, and she she says, I'll leave him in the hands of God. And she put him on the river, and Moses found himself in the arms of Pharaoh's daughter. 
Moses found himself growing up in Pharaoh's house. But he nursed at his mother's breast. When she realized, when, when, when uh, Pharaoh's daughter found Moses, she says, go find me a woman who had just recently given birth so that she can nurse this child. And they find Moses' mom. And Moses' mom and nurses him. And I'm quite sure as she's nursing him, she's telling him who he is. She says, you're my child. You're the son of, you're one of the chosen one, the people of Hebrews descent. And she, she can see that and she can put her thoughts and her will in, in teaching Moses who he is. So Moses grows up in Pharaoh's house feeling a little different than the other princes of Egypt. Moses walks through realizing that he is an imposter. He realized that, that I, I'm not who people think I am. I'm not who people say I am. And he walks around waiting to be discovered, waiting to, feel, to figure it out, for somebody to figure out, I'm not who you think I am. I have these great garments. I have these great robes. But I'm not who you think I am. If you only knew who I am, you'll realize that I'm a slave. And just by the grace of God, I would be out there with them. He realized that for the first 40 years of Moses' life, he just pranced around as a prince of Egypt. But yet the people, the slaves in which he came from, would look at him knowing who he is and say, he thinks he's all that. He ain't all that. He's not that good. He's just a slave. He's just been accepted. He's not better than I am. But Moses figuring out that one day somebody's going to point him out Somebody's going to call him out and say, you are an imposter. I can see Moses going around feeling guilt. I don't know where it is in your life, but you may feel that I'm an imposter. A lot of people go to work every day going, I don't know how I got this job. I don't know why I'm in this position. I don't know who, who, how did I fall into this? I'm an imposter. If they only knew and people are coming and, and asking for wisdom and asking for leadership and asking for understanding. And you're like, if they only knew, your kids come up to you and say, dad, I think you know everything. Dad is the strongest, the biggest, the smartest person I know. And you, you, you're looking at your kids saying, if they only knew. <laughs> I'm an imposter walking around here. <laughs> yes. Moses, not only feeling that he's a po- an imposter, he realized that one day he could see his real people, the Hebrews, a Hebrew man being beaten. And that person was being beaten to the point of death. And Moses intervened and he stopped the hand of the soldier that was beating one of his Hebrew men. And he, he stopped him and he ended up killing that man and burying him. And, and he thought that, that no one would know. But the news went out and Pharaoh found out that Moses, his, nep- his, his grandson, the one that's walking around as a prince of Egypt, is, is now a murderer. And he, he puts out an edict so that nothing else, no one else can usurp Pharaoh's power. He puts out an edict to go and arrest Moses. And Moses takes off and starts running because he's not only now an imposter, he's a murderer. He's a murderer. He, we're talking about anti-heroes today. And, and when you, you may have heard the Sunday school version of Moses. I'm talking to the adult version of Moses right now. <laughs> this is, this is now, now as a murderer, a person who has done wrong to someone else. So a person that says, I can't come back from this. He, and he says, I don't know how many people out here right now, I don't know if you're listening to me right now, you say, there are certain things that I've done in my past that I just don't think I can come back from. I'm telling you, listen a little longer because God works through messed up people. Moses takes off and he starts running and he runs and he ends up in the land of Midian and and he starts raising sheep. He starts doing a job of a teenage boy and he stays there for another 40 years and Moses is no longer now Moses is not only an imposter not only a a murderer but Moses is now a coward he runs and he says I'm not going to take responsibility for my actions he runs away 
And for 40 years, he spends his time in Midian, hiding out, hoping that no one would ever find me. And he, see, he starts doing the job of that teenage boy. Teenage boys were shepherds. But Moses is 80 years old doing that job. It's like a job that, that he says, I'm, I'm already above my station, but he says, I'm still doing this job. It feels like I've made no progress in life. I don't know about you, but there's probably a place in your life where you say, I feel like there, I'm making no progress in my life. I'm not moving forward in my life. And you go around moping and, and, and worrying and feeling sorry for yourself. You're feeling, and your, your, your whole uh, esteem, self-esteem is being degraded. Not because somebody else is putting that demand on you. It's just how you see yourself. It's how you see and you think and the, the internal voices that are in your head. Not because somebody's doing it. You treat everybody as if they're doing it, but, but it's really just coming from your own self-talk. Mm. And yet, we realize that God works through the anti-hero. Moses is now an imposter, a murderer, a coward. He's an 80-year-old anti-hero, as we're about to discover because not too long after he gets there, after 80 years, he encounters something. While, while doing mundane, routine things that he's been doing for the last 40 years, Moses encounters something. Let's go to the scripture and let's read it. It says in Exodus, the third chapter and the first verse, it says, One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law. Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. So Moses says, this is an amazing and so Moses then says, why isn't this bush burning up? I must go and see. So Moses then goes over, and when the Lord saw Moses coming, to take a closer look, God called him from the middle of the bush. Moses, Moses, Moses turns around and he says, here I am. What you realize is that Moses' worst fear just came into fruition. Moses has been a, what well, he's been an imposter. He's been a murderer. And now he's a coward. And he was in hiding. And now someone has found him. You see, someone knows who he is. They called him by his name. And th that means they know who he is. And Moses... He's sitting there going, I've been caught. I mean, my, my past is now caught up to me. And, and something is going to happen to me. And Moses says, yeah, here I am. I've been discovered. And he goes on and he says, who's this? And he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face. I believe he covered his face because that means not only they discovered who he is, not just a prince of Egypt, they know who he really is. He's a Hebrewite. He's a Hebrew, an Israelite, and they know exactly who he is now. They recognize that, Moses, you were one of these slaves. You're one of the people of, of the slaves that were captured and, and that worked so hard back in Egypt. His, his identity has been blown. He covers his face in shame. He covers his face saying, I hope he doesn't really, he got a clear look at me. And he's like, what, what's going on here? He's afraid. God, don't you know he already sees? He already knows the real you. He knows what you're trying to put on a show. He knows what you're trying to show everybody else. Don't you know God has already figured you out? He knows you. He knows your name. He knows every hair on your head. God knows everything about you. So trying to say, I got to become perfect to be the hero for Jesus, to receive me and accept me, 
There's something wrong with that statement because God already knows I'm not perfect. Moses realized that he's been figured out. He realized, and, and you know what we expect from God? And I hear this also often when people finally come through those doors, they think the ceiling is going to fall down on them because they, they've finally been in church once in, in the last 18 years, and they think that God is angry with them, no different than what Moses is probably figuring out. If God knows who I am, if this God knows who I am, he should be angry with me. He should punish me. I'm waiting for the hammer to fall. This is the expectation that Moses has. Moses doesn't have to worry, though, because God does his best work through the anti-hero. God, God likes to, to move. He shows himself strong while working through the anti-hero. But yet, Moses doesn't know this yet. God says, I'm just about ready to demonstrate my power, my glory, my everything that I am through you, Moses. And yet Moses is sitting there. He says, but, but God, I can't do what you want me to do. Moses starts making excuses for not doing what God had called him to do. God was calling Moses and said, I want you to go down to Egypt and all your, your, those slaves down there, I want you to, I'm going to deliver my people because I've heard their cries. I know who they are, I've heard them, and now it's time for me to rescue them. It's my time to be the hero. That's what God is, is telling Moses. God is telling Moses, it's my time to be the hero of their story, and yet, Moses, I'm going to need you to go on and do something so that I can show my power to my people. And Moses sits there and he says, no, Lord, no, you can't do this. He starts making excuses. And I think we do the same thing. We are just like Moses. When God tells us to do something, as I preached last week, we start making excuses of why we can't do it. It says, look at the next verse. In, in the 11th verse, it says, but Moses protested to God. Who am I? to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? Who do you think I am? I'm not that good. I'm not that powerful. I can't do this on my own. This is the thing that Moses is thinking. Moses is saying, yeah, well, at some point, I am disqualified from trying to do this. You chose the wrong person to do this. I'm not educated enough. I'm not good enough. Where is it that you say the same thing? A lot of times we at this church, we ask you to do something. We say, join, put your hands in to do something. Try to uh, show love and kindness to some other people. We have days that we turn off service. We cut down and shut down the church, and we say, go into the community and do some act of kindness. Be the hands and feet of Christ, and we won't even get up to go do something simple, to show people God's power, God's grace on them. We won't even do that because we, we want to sit and say, well, I'm disqualified. What if they ask me a question? I can't lead a connect group. What if they ask a question that I don't know? I'm not qualified. We do the same thing as Moses is doing here. I told you, you can see yourself in the anti-hero. And God answers him. God says, well, Moses, I'll be with you. You go down and, and I'll be with you. You notice that God didn't validate Moses' claim of who he thought or what he thought about himself. God, didn't, God did not validate and say, yeah, Mary, Moses, you are uneducated. Yeah, Moses, you are a little old. He didn't say any of those things. He just said this one thing to Moses. He says, I will be with you. I will be with you, Moses. It's not about you, Moses, in other words. It's about me. You don't have to worry about what condition you're in, how imperfect you are. Just focus on me because it's not about you, Moses. It's about God doing his work through you. Life isn't all about you, you know. Your life is just beginning when you pair up with God and allow God to work through you. Then you're talking about a fulfilled life. Moses is sitting there saying, well, if you're going to be with me, who are you? And God answers, God replies to Moses, I am 
who I am. He says, he says, this to, he says say this to the people of Israel, when the people are Hebrew people, when they think that, that why, who sent you, Moses? Who, who are you? And Moses says, just tell them, I am sent me. I am. You, in other words, fill in the blank. You fill, what do you think he is? He's the king of everything. He's the Lord of everything. I am sent you. He is your provider. He is your healer. He is your banner. He is your father. He is Jesus. He says, I am sent you. He says, Moses, I want you to stop making excuses. But Moses goes and he shifts and he starts thinking again about something else. He's about to make an excuse. And Moses says, but Moses protested again. And, with, and what if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? You know, God says, it's not about you. I, I'll, I'll demonstrate my power. God says, throw down your staff. His staff turned into a serpent. He, and he says, wow, geez, Moses is starting to learn how God is going to work through him. God is, this is like the, the origin story of the anti-hero. Moses is learning how to use his power. God is training him in the wilderness. Moses is learning how to tap into God's infinite power and resources. And he says, this is what you're going to need to do. Moses is training out there in the desert. God's showing him how extraordinary God is. And it doesn't matter how ordinary you are. God says, I'm the one that's going to do the great things. Don't limit me. Don't limit me by your failures, by your apprehension. But Moses, again, he starts pleading with God. He starts making more excuses. He says, but Moses pleaded with the Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now. I get tongue-tied, and my words just get tangled. I'm not quick-witted. I, I can't speak fast. I'm not good at talking to people. I fumble my words, he says. He says, I'm not really great at speaking at all, God. In fact, I don't even like people. <laughs> He says, I'm flawed again. He, you see, we're still talking about Moses looking at all his faults, all the things he can't get right. And God says, I know, I made you. I made your lips. I made your tongue. I know you. And then it says, but Moses again pleaded with the Lord, please send one else, someone else. He's basically saying, God, aren't you listening to me? Choose somebody else. There's got to be somebody better. And you say that. You know. <laughs> you at home. You, you listening to me online. You know you say that. There's got to be somebody better. You sitting in front of me. You know you say that. God, it, it, you must use somebody else. Why do you keep asking it of me? And finally, after all that, the scripture says this. Then the Lord became angry. <laughs> After hearing all the excuses, trying to say, get somebody else to do it, now finally, God, is, you want God to get angry? Don't do what he says. <laughs> Don't listen to his instructions. Don't follow what he's declaring for you to do. That's the time that God got angry. He says, it doesn't matter how humiliating and debilitating your issues are, how big your faults are, your failures are. God became angry with the antihero because he chose not to do something. All of this was inner talk. No one else accused Moses of anything. All of this was his inner talk. You see, the lie that we go with, this is another lie that we tend to embrace and we go with. And this is what the lie that Moses was really telling God at this time. He says, you know what? I have to go it alone. I'm used to the last 80 years. I'm used to living my life alone. I'm used to making it on my own strength and doing these own, my own things. And what we're telling God when we refuse to do what he's asking us to do, we're telling God, God, I only think no one sees you, God. They're going to see me look like a fool up here. They're not going to see you, God. And God is saying, wait a minute, you're not alone. The first thing he told Moses is, 
I am with you. And I don't care where you are, whether you're at home and you say, well, I I know I'm not a good mom and I I, I have all these faults. I don't know how God is going to let me parent the way I should parent. And God is saying, you are not alone. You say, I, I know I want to be a great dad, and, and, and I have my faults. I get angry quick, and I, 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 I don't pay the attention that I need to pay attention to. And God is saying, I am with you. You see, a lot of times, and this used to get me all upset, when we say, I'm just waiting for God to show up. God is saying, don't wait for me to show up. I'm already with you. I'm already where you are. Don't wait on me. I, I'm waiting on you. <laughs> And and he says, I'm with you. I, you don't have to do this on your own. But every time we refuse to do what God, what God is telling us to do, we're telling God, you're, you're making me go alone. You're not with me. And God is saying, I just need you to start taking action. See, the hero has to overcome his internal talk. He has to overcome his internal apprehensions. And he has to begin to do something. He has to take action. God is saying, I'm asking you to take action. Because we've been conditioned in our society, every action movie that we've ever seen, you know, we, we could see the calamity taking place, and we, we then see the lone hero, Tom Cruise, running down the, down the highway. You know, it's him trying to rescue someone. The lone person, superheroes do it alone. But God is saying, you're not just any kind of superhero. You're an anti-hero. You're imperfect. That means you need people like me to come alongside and help. That's why I've given you my strength, my power to endure and to overcome whatever it is that you're facing. You do not have to do it alone. But I'm not enough. I'm not enough, God. You don't have to be alone. Get this picture. He went down there. When he went back to Egypt, he still was an imposter. He still was a murderer. He still was a coward. But now, because he took action, he's an anti-hero. And this truth you should know for yourself. We don't have to go it alone. We're not made to go it alone. We see that all the way from Genesis, the beginning, the first story in Genesis. Man was not made to be alone. Regardless of the baggage you're carrying, that's why we encourage you to get involved in connect groups. And we're looking for connect group leaders. uh, Text the church leader and sign up to be a connect group. Don't let your fear, a connect group leader, don't let your fear prevent you from doing that. It's time for us to live life together. God has said, I've put each and every one of you in this place in a unique position so that you can support each other with all the baggage that each and every one of you carry. No one is perfect, and you don't have to be. I'm willing to work through you, the anti-hero. I want you to stop arguing with God. Stop arguing with God and decide that today you are going to join him and start doing something to furthering his kingdom. This is what God said to his successor, to Moses' successor. When When Moses died and God went to Joshua, God says to Joshua this final thing, and I want us to use this as our prayer today as we end this morning. This is my command, he says. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And you notice what he's saying? He is with you, present tense. He's right now with you wherever you go. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you. Be strong. This is my prayer. I'm already closing. Be strong 
and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you. I want you to say that to yourself. I'm strong. I'm courageous. I'm not afraid. I will not be discouraged because the Lord, my God, is with me. And God does his best work through the anti-hero. God does his greatest work through you too. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for you are with us, ever present right now. Lord God, that you are doing everything for us to, to embrace your power, to realize that, that you are the hero of our story. You're the hero of this land. You're the hero of everything that ails our society, our families, our, our, even our own selves. Lord God, you are the hero. And Lord God, we just thank you right now that you've invited us along the journey to, to participate in helping rescue a hurt and dying world, one that is far from you. You, you called us alongside to, 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 to help in reaching them for you so that they can tap into you, tap into the power. They don't have to be perfect, but they can too rescue another. That's the greatest gift. And Lord God, we thank you and we give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Let's worship together.